Welcome everybody. I'm Anita Nikolich. I'm the Director of Research Innovation and a Research Scientist at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I'm the Co-Director of the DEF CON AI Village. The Task Force on American Innovation is a nonpartisan alliance of leading American companies, business associations, research universities, and scientific associations. TFAI supports federally funded scientific research and promotes its benefits to America's economy, security, and quality of life. The task force is particularly concerned with research and educational funding in the physical sciences and engineering. Today, our panelists will discuss how the combination of public and private funding is crucial for advancements in AI. Uh, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box uh, and our panelists will attempt to answer them. Don't put them in the chat. I would now like to welcome the House AI Caucus Chair, Congress Jerry McNerney from California to tell us about the AI caucus and the work they're doing. Congressman McNerney was sworn into office on January 4th, 2007, and he serves on the Committee on Energy and Commerce and the House Committee on Sp Science, Space, and Technology. McNerney, who has a PhD in mathematics, served several years as an engineering contractor to Sandia National Labs in New Mexico. Congressman McNerney, please go ahead with your remarks. Well, good morning and thank you. Uh, it's great uh, to be here this morning. Um, AI is an area that I have deeply involved with in Congress. As a mathematician, it's a field in which I have deep interest. I serve as the co-chair of the House AI Caucus. The goal of the caucus is to bring together members of Congress who are working on artificial intelligence issues and to help inform members of Congress and staff about AI and its policy implications. And finally, to dig into both opportunities and challenges that AI presents. It's a bipartisan group of members and the events we have put together have generated significant interest. And that speaks to the attention that AI is getting in Congress. I'd also like to highlight a few of the legislative issues I've been working on concerning artificial intelligence. For one thing, I think it's important to address the use of AI by federal government agencies. I'm pleased that last year, my legislation, the AI and Government Act, was enacted into law. Among other things, the AI and Government Act establishes an AI center of excellence to facilitate the adoption of AI technologies within the federal government. This will provide a central resource within the government to aid agencies with AI adoption and to help agencies share their best practices. It's also critical that agencies build up their capacity to internally adopt AI technology. Last month, the House passed HR 3723, the Consumer Safety Technology Act. This legislation will empower the Consumer Product Safety Commission to use artificial intelligence in furtherance of its agency's mission. The CPSC's experience here will also serve as an example for other agencies that are looking to integrate AI into the pursuit of their missions. Second, another key priority in Congress for me is examining what actions we should be taking to mitigate the risk of bias in artificial intelligence. How do we ensure that those developing AI tools and systems have a diverse workforce that is building this technology? How do we ensure that proper steps are being taken to examine labeled data sets that are used to train these systems? And how do we ensure that sufficient testing is done before the systems are deployed? Third, another important area of focus for me in Congress is ensuring that our nation is leading when it comes to research and development in artificial intelligence. This will require collaboration and contributions from the federal government the private sector, and academia. Last year, I co-led legislation that established the National AI Initiative, which was signed into law as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. This law authorizes $6.5 billion for AI R&D federal investment, which is an important first step, but more investment will clearly be needed as noted in the National Security Commission on AI's recommendation to Congress. I'm taking a closer look at this and many of the other recommendations from the commission. 
Again, I want to thank the TFAI for having me today, and I hope you enjoy your discussion. Thank you so much, Congressman. Those are awesome remarks. I would now like to introduce Dr. Chad Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins is the Associate Director of the Undergraduate Program and a Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Michigan. Dr. Jenkins, please go ahead with your remarks. Uh, thank you very much. And so I will share a screen right now. Um, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. And so I just wanted to, to give some context for artificial intelligence and as something that's coming in terms of three waves, the past, the present, and the future. Uh, before I get into, the, in, into that, I just want to say a little bit about myself. So I've been working in robotics and artificial intelligence for 25 years. Um, and I just would, would pose to you, what question do you think I get the most when I'm walking around campus or just doing, uh, doing whatever? Um, and, uh, and so just for the sake of time, I will, I will not uh, keep you in suspense. And it would be, uh, am I with the football team? Uh, so before, before we start talking about AI and robotics, you know, we usually have, uh, have those because I look very different than your typical artificial intelligence. And so at the University of Michigan, that answer is clearly no, I'm not with the football team. Uh, but it was true uh, back in 1989 when I was just a, a freshman who had dreams of, of, uh, of, of artificial intelligence. And, uh, and over time, I've been fortunate to have to be supported uh, by a number of, 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 of federal agencies that have supported my work and allowed me to develop into a contributor and a leader in artificial intelligence. And when I've come into this, uh, as I've come into to my, my development in artificial intelligence, I saw the first wave of AI, which we call model-based AI, where we had artificial intelligence that allow us to think through an entire problem. Um, and so this, this came through in, in the, um, this was really founded in 1956 with the founding conference of artificial intelligence. At the time in the 60s and 70s, uh, AI was about solving relatively simple problems that we could completely model, such as tic-tac-toe. Um, by the time we got into the 90s, uh, AI could solve a much more complex problems, such as IBM's ability to defeat the, the uh, chess grandmaster, uh, Gary Kasparov. Um, those same algorithms that we have in terms that allow us to do search and model problems completely is literally what's driving uh, uh, navigation and autonomous vehicles. Um, every time you use uh, Google Maps, there's this AI search algorithm underneath that. Uh, those uh, search algorithms allow us to allow our autonomous cars to move throughout the world. And we're able to build large scale 3D maps uh, using this AI technology. We can really model the, the world geometrically. Um, but the problem with these, these algorithms is that they are rational and they're robust. We understand what they're doing, but they're very slow. And so, uh, and so they take a lot of time. And so we've seen uh, just about 10 years ago is the, is the emergence of the second wave of AI, which has been data-driven, that learns from lots of data. And, this is, and so really, if you hear the word deep learning or, uh, or neural networks, so these are convolutional neural networks, which was really catalyzed by the AlexNet network, um, that really is what we talk about when we say AI these days. Um, deep learning has allowed us to, to see all sorts of things. So when you're talking about facial recognition um, and, and, and detecting people and various things from images, uh, deep learning is behind that. Um, in addition, if you're talking to, to Amazon Alexa or Apple Siri, you're talking to a neural network that's helping you understand, that's helping understand what you're doing. And this dates, it, this also dates back uh, to, the, to, the, to the 50s, to back to Rosenblatt's perceptrons, um, which was really one of the first, uh, first neural networks for, um, for doing image-based recognition. And so this development in AI that you've seen really took decades of, of, of investment and research to occur. These systems are accurate and fast, but unfortunately, they're unpredictable. Uh, they can get high accuracy rates, uh, but they can be easily fooled. So in the, as a roboticist, I care a lot about driverless cars and how they function. And so there's just some simple examples can, 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 be, can be very, uh, very concerning, such as if, a, if one of these AI systems is looking at a stop sign, all you have to do is make simple modifications, whether those modifications are benign or malicious, to make to maybe fool the system into thinking that a stop line is a, a stop sign is a speed limit sign, and so that is very concerning. This is a, a relatively simple example, but this uh, this shows how how deep the problem can uh, it it gives some indicators about how deep the problem can go. 
And so this has given rise to what we're calling the third wave of AI, where we want to combine the first wave, the model based on the data driven, to generate explanations. And we want to have these systems be accurate, fast, and accountable, in addition to, um, to being ethical, fair, adaptable, and sustainable uh, within the resources of our climate. And so there has been the AI roadmap that's come together by the Computing Consortium Community and the Association for, uh, for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence that is laying the groundwork and has uh, for how we think about this, uh, think about AI moving forward. In addition, this, they've, uh, they've really helped start catalyze uh, the, um, the AI institutes and many of the, the ways that we're thinking about AI moving forward. Um, just to give one example of what third wave AI could look like, um, imagine that you were giving a handwritten digit uh, and that, that could look like a nine or a four. Um, you wanna, there's gonna be inherent uncertainty in that, but you want an AI to tell you when it recognizes this, why it thought that, why it made that, that guess, why it made that estimation. And that way we can get some accountability for the decisions that are coming out of these systems. Um, and so this really is just to, to give, uh, just give some context um, the next way of AI, we've had a number, the, the, the CCC has a number of, of papers, quadrennial papers that go into the artificial intelligence, what it looks like moving forward. Um, I'm just highlighting a few of these issues that federal investment is needed for, for success for the nation in a globally competitive environment where we can produce the leaders of the, uh, the, the next leaders of AI. And we really don't know where these next breakthroughs are going to come from. So we really need diversity as we move forward. So with that, I will, I will pass back and thank you very much for your time. That would not be the most common robotics question I would think you'd get, but uh, very interesting talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Jenkins. And uh, Dr. Jenkins will be around. So if you have some Q&A, uh, please put them in the box and um, he will uh, answer. So I'd now like to introduce our panel. Um, we have four very interesting panelists. First, we have Dr. Blaise Aguera Yarkas, Vice President at Google Research. He will discuss Google's approach to fundamental machine learning research, give some examples of discoveries integrated into Google products, and talk about where he sees the frontier and future of fundamental research and product applications. Dr. Talitha Washington, she is the inaugural director of the Atlanta University Center Consortia on Data Science Initiative and a professor of mathematics at Clark Atlanta University. She will discuss the most effective ways of using government support to increase representation of historically marginalized groups in AI ML research and touch on how the future of AI ML innovation depends on increased representation. And Dr. John R. Smith, he is an IBM fellow in AI tech at AB IBM Research. He works at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. He will, will provide some history on research and collaboration with government and where IBM sees future frontiers. And we have Dr. Court Corley, he is a chief data scientist and group leader of data sciences and analytics at Pacific Northwest National Lab. He will talk about what the role of the National Labs is in AI ML algorithms and hardware de development, what they view as the most exciting ML frontiers and how PNNL and the National Labs are working with partners in government and industry to drive the field forward. So welcome panelists. Um, I have some, some pre-prepared questions they're gonna talk about. And then I would leave it up to the audience. If you have some questions, please put in the Q&A box because you want to get to as many of your questions as possible. So I'm going to start with Dr. Corley. Um, can you tell us how are the US national labs and your lab, PNNL specifically, how are they driving innovation in AI and ML with support from DOE and other federal research agencies? The second part of that is what do you feel are the most important contributions the national labs have made to this field? So Dr. Corley. Well, thanks so much for having me here. So I've been at PNNL for 12 years, focusing my research on data science and AI and its application to scientific discovery, energy sustainability, and other areas of importance to the US government. My national lab colleagues and I are working to advance the state of the art in AI and machine learning and algorithms and hardware and apply those advances to critical missions. We have a unique place in the ecosystem connected closely to agency missions to do discovery based science and partner with academia and industry. We take the unique and challenging federal mission applications and use them to drive hardware and algorithms forward. In my opinion, uh, national labs are driving innovation uh, in three key areas, uh, AI for science, co design of algorithms and hardware and learning with limited data. First in AI for science. We're working hard to incorporate knowledge about scientific theory into AI algorithms. 
Uh, and this has many benefits. It increases the explainability of AI algorithms when scientific theories and knowledge are encapsulated in them. Uh, integrated known scientific principles, the laws of, like the laws of conservation of energy or gravity, can make algorithms more efficient, reducing computing and data needs of the algorithms. The Physics Informed Learning Machines Center is a consortium of UE labs with academic partners at Brown, MIT, Stanford, and University of California, Santa Barbara. And Films is uncovering hidden physics based on new developments in deep learning. Um, and they have released a software package that's been downloaded tens of thousands of times and it's being used by many different organizations. Um, one example is that the Physics Informed Machine Learning Tool is being used to augment algorithms that look at how fluids move helping better understand how contaminants like per and polyfluoroalkyl substances uh, move underground, which in turn helps with environmental remediation. Second, DOE has a history of partnering with industry on co-design. Um, and co-design is the tight development of algorithms and hardware to solve unique application challenges. And most recently through DOE's Exascale Computing Project. Uh, the department is leading co-design to future algorithms, developing new hardware design and simulation capabilities, and working directly with industry to evaluate hardware prototypes in challenging computing applications. As we speak, Dewey Labs are working with established companies like NVIDIA uh, and newer startups like Cerebras and Salmanova to accelerate development of new AI-focused hardware with co-designed algorithms. Um, and for the third area, uh, today, most AI models really rely on the approach called deep learning that Dr. Jenkins talked about that requires massive amounts of data that's been curated and labeled uh, or described. One of the major challenges in developing approaches that can learn well with less data um, is really important, and that is one of the things we're working on since many of the applications we care about uh, don't have access to massive amounts of, of labeled data. So national labs and academia are well suited to develop these algorithms as we frequently encounter these challenges with limited data in scientific research. Um, across the labs, researchers are developing new methods that can deliver useful uh, and meaningful results based on only a few examples and applying them to, for example, biomedicine studies where we're looking for toxin exposure in cells or studying the microscopic properties of materials to understand how they impact molecular performance for drug discovery, really at the interface of biological and chemical reactions. Um, these advances in AI for science, co-design of algorithms and hardware, and learning with limited data uh, are really incredibly exciting to be working on uh, with my National Lab colleagues. Uh, and that concludes my answer for the first question. Thank you so much. And if there's any questions, uh, please put them again into the uh, Q&A and our panelists would get to them. So next, I have a question for Blaze. So you, you lead a large research group at Google looking at AI. How does Google approach its machine learning research investments? And why do you feel government investments are relevant for a well-resourced company like Google? Um, thank you. Uh, so these are, these are great questions. Uh, I'll begin with, with uh, Google's investments and how, how they approach it. And what, what I, you know, and a couple of examples of some of the most exciting things that I, that I see us doing uh, today. Um, so Google is one of the uh, largest remaining uh, of the big research labs uh, in, um, uh, in, in computer science in, in the private sector. Uh, we, we invested um, $27 billion in R&D uh, in 2020, and uh, a large portion of that was, uh, was in uh, Google Research in, in, uh, in our organization, which works on fundamental uh, innovation. And uh, a, a lot of that fundamental innovation is in AI and machine learning uh, that's become uh, central to Google's business. And it's also work that we do very much out in the open. Uh, the vast majority of that, of that research gets published uh, as soon as we do it. Uh, it, goes in, it, it, it gets published in the form of open data sets and research papers that get put on, on archive, which is the big uh, repository of papers that, that, uh, that for open access that, that everybody in the world has access to. In, in a way, the whole innovation process for AI and machine learning is this kind of worldwide uh, collective project uh, that, that is contributed to by, by tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of researchers all over, all over the world. And, and, and the, the, the speed the, the kind of speed of, of progress is very much a function of that openness in those numbers. Um, Google's role is quite prominent in all of this, uh, despite despite its overall size, uh, the overall size of the of, of the effort. 
um, the the big uh, the big conference in AI, uh, NeurIPS, uh, is um, uh, I think that Google had not only the most papers in uh, NeurIPS last year, but but more than the next largest contributor by by a factor of two or so. So um, so we're doing a you know a huge amount of a huge amount of work in in, in this area. Um, and uh, I'm, you know, I'm very excited by a bunch of specific projects. I, I can give a couple of examples uh, that, that I think are, are kind of paradigmatic. Uh, one of them is, is one from my own group called Federated Learning. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about this one because it combines uh, artificial intelligence with privacy technologies. Uh, privacy is, is really the reason that I came to work at Google in the first place eight years ago. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, I was very concerned with the idea that, that, that as, uh, you know, as has been mentioned already, uh, these new approaches to AI rely heavily on massive amounts of data. And um, the idea that, that AI is in a sort of trade-off relationship with, with privacy of user data is one that I found uh, very uncomfortable. And, and really made it sort of my mission and the mission of, of my team to address that. Um, that started off as a fairly crazy idea eight years ago. Uh, I'm running an organization now of 600 people, uh, largely focused on that problem. And uh, federated learning is, is, I think, one of our most important achievements. And it involves taking the learning process of, uh, of AI and distributing it among all of the devices that are participating in such a way that, that, that users' private data doesn't ever leave the device. The, the learning happens in a decentralized way such that Google never sees uh, that private data and yet all of that, all of that data can still be used as part of the learning process. It's, very, it's, very, um, it's a very exciting uh, result and it's being used in, in, um, in Google's keyboard, which obviously processes a lot of very private information. Uh, Apple is now using it in their keyboard as well. Uh, and we're seeing it increasingly getting used in, in uh, assistants. Uh, of, of various kinds uh, and many other applications. Uh, there, there are now um, you know, many, many more publications in federated learning coming from outside Google than from inside by, uh, it was I think by a factor of, of 10 uh, last year and, and by a factor of more like 100 this year. So it's a field that, that you know, there's really been taking off. Um, another maybe more modest example uh, is uh, Deep, Deep Lab, which is uh, an approach to image processing that is being used by a lot of researchers all over the world for, uh, for analyzing microscopy images of, of cells or of animals uh, behaving. It sort of can, can crop out uh, you know, um, uh, pictures of animals from their backgrounds and analyze them uh, in terms of movements. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and that's become a fundamental research tool um, for, uh, for neuroscientists and uh, animal uh, behavior researchers and all sorts of other uh, scientists. Um, and uh, you know, my third and final example, I'm just trying to sort of span the space of different sorts of things, uh, would be Lambda, which, uh, which we just uh, spoke about at, at the last uh, Google I.O. conference and is a language model that, um, that is really, uh, it's really compelling uh, step, I, I believe, toward artificial general intelligence or you know, not just the ability for neural nets to perform low level functions in, in vision or perception or, uh, or next word prediction or something like this, but to really be able to carry out dialogues uh, and I have to say, like having conversations with 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 Lambda, you know, you you really are starting to get that sort of um, um, spooky and amazing feeling that that uh, that you're you're talking to something that is starting to verge on being a who uh, and and not just an it, um, which raises, of course, all kinds of uh, all kinds of you know of of both both scary and extraordinary uh, prospects for uh, for the future. But um, in any case, um, you know, the, you you asked about about government investment and and. Um, despite despite Google's very very large levels of investment today and everything that we're doing now in the field, I, I do want to actually point out that Frank Rosenblatt in the 1950s was working on neural nets already, uh, and at that time, uh, his view and the view of the cyberneticists uh, that that neural nets and connectionism were going to be the way that artificial intelligence works that was a minority view. Uh, and it became even more of a minority view over the coming over the coming decades, and uh, all you know there were there were essentially many many different approaches to thinking about machine learning and artificial intelligence that were attempted from the fifties all the way through the early two thousands, and now it's it's clear you know which which ones are producing the extraordinary results and 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 industry is jumping in and essentially milking uh, you know an investment of many decades and vast amounts of resources that were made ultimately by by the government. Um, and uh, you know, without that, without that seed corn, all of this idea of entrepreneurial investment just doesn't work. 
Uh, Marina Mazzucato, the, uh, the economist, has written some books that I think are very good about exactly how important government investment is uh, in, in things that we think about as entrepreneurial tech. There's this mythology, you know, I think especially in the US that, that uh, entrepreneurial technology development is the way innovation happens, and it's just not the case. You know, you look at any, any big, um, uh, any big tech that that everybody you know thinks of as very very advanced, sophisticated in in in, in the consumer space, and and look at its origins, and you find uh, massive amounts of government investment many many years before. So if we're going to have that seed corn for the coming decades, uh, you know we we can't assume that that uh, that industries uh, you know work on the things that we already know to uh, to to bear fruit today are going to be the same thing that's bearing fruit tomorrow. Great, thank you so much. And I see there's a lot of questions in the Q&A. If any of the panelists would like to type an answer, feel free. Uh, once we don't get to uh, after this session, we will uh, do some Q&A from the, from the box. I'd like to turn over to Dr. Smith from IBM. Uh, what was IBM's role in laying the foundation for recent advances in, it, in machine learning? In what role did government funding play in that process at IBM? Second part, what are your current AI ML research uh, focuses at IBM? Yeah, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure and honor to participate on the panel today. Uh, I am John Smith and I'm a research scientist and fellow at IBM TJ Watson Research Center. So maybe first a little bit of uh, history. Uh, IBM has long been one of the world leaders in information technology and our commitment to innovation was demonstrated again this year as we topped the list of US patents for the 28th consecutive time. Along with uh, our focus on hybrid cloud, cybersecurity, and quantum computing, IBM is playing a leading role in developing and applying AI. And we have a long history of doing so. As we heard from Dr. Jenkins, IBM may have been the first to capture the world's imagination in AI by creating the first chess playing computer in 1997 that was able to defeat the then reigning world champion. Uh, fast forward to 2011 and IBM did it again uh, by creating Watson as a breakthrough capability in, in AI that could answer questions posed in, in natural language. And we were able to uh, defeat uh, champions at, at Jeopardy. Uh, government investment in research has played an essential role in allowing IBM to explore uh, this frontier of innovation. The deep QA system, which uh, was underlying the Watson Jeopardy system grew directly out of government investment in research, including uh, the Acquaint program on question answering, as well as the Trek evaluations administered by NIST, which were absolutely essential for enabling our technology progress. So as we continue to actively pursue foundational work on advancing, uh, trusting and scaling AI. So as we move from narrow AI, you know, that uh, Dr. Um, Jenkins has described to more of a broad AI capability where systems need to learn from less data. Uh, we need to combine learning and reasoning to solve more complex tasks. Uh, we need to, to incorporate knowledge and make it broadly transferable. And importantly, we need to make advances on the foundations of trust to ensure fairness and explainability, uh, transparency in how our AI capabilities are put together. And this will be critical for scaling adoption broadly by society. Um, as, as we continue this work, um, government investment is, is critical. History has shown that we make tremendous progress when we work together. So when we invest and partner across government, industry, academia, and all of the stakeholders, and government investment will be critical for planting these research seeds and driving innovation together with industry to achieve this technological world of AI for tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I remember how exciting it was watching uh, Watson play Jeopardy. So we look forward to more from, from IBM. Uh, next, we have Dr. Washington. Uh, we've heard about risks to US leadership, and there's a question in Q&A about this, from lack of overall US investments in research. But what are the risks if this investment goes to the same group of researchers over and over? 
Great question. Thank you for that. And I'll start by paraphrasing Einstein. The definition of insanity is taking the same approach to a problem and hoping for a different outcome. And this is the same case for diversity. And we need diversity to be strong if we are to hold on to our technology leadership. We have all seen misuses of AI anywhere from facial recognition, predictive policing, voting deterrence that have disenfranchised um, people of color in this country. And we need to have these diverse perspectives come in and build and grow research in AI and ML that is socially and culturally responsible. So based on my experiences as a mathematics professor at two HBCUs, and also as my time as an NSF program director and the education director, my opinion is that yes, we can conclude that often funding goes to a larger institution that historically gets funding instead of institutions that are designed to support the broader workforce by the education of underrepresented minorities. Our community has unfortunately, from my vantage point, adopted a research funding mechanism avoiding grants that exhibit white leadership and black fellowship. So the risk of doing this is that we are leaving out an important talent of our conversation and this must change. So historically, Blacks, Brown, Indigenous folks have been constant contributor to the arts, STEM, ideas, and innovation that have contributed to the building of our great country. As it stands, not investing in integrating this minoritized US voices, including Black, Latinx, Indigenous communities, and other underrepresented minorities, we are missing the creativity that put America ahead of most countries over the last 100 years. We all know that talent is parsed across the nation's population equally via Gaussian distribution, but access to opportunity is not. We must leverage the diversity of our nation, including race, gender, and ethnicity, but also geography and institution type. We can't beat the competition in AI and ML innovations if we have 30% of our folks on the bench. So we really need to take a serious look at diversity and not do things the way we've done them, but do them in innovative ways that really push these AI ML frontiers forward. I'm gonna ask a follow-up that I see in the Q&A. This is for you, Dr. Washington. It's kind of tangential to what you're saying, but we have a question from Roy Harrington, um, which says, in terms of the technological race between the US and China, the latter has more STEM graduates than the former. Do you think China will eclipse the US in 2021 in terms of innovation, creativity, technological advancements, robotics? Um, maybe this kind of dovetails with your uh, comments about diversity and inclusion. Would you like to um, discuss that? Yeah, so we're kind of in this um, global competition race and we have a lot of untapped resources here in the United States just because of some of the social barriers that we have placed on people and the expectations we placed on people because of where they come from and who they look like. If we're really gonna advance as a nation and really develop artificial intelligence and machine learning to benefit the greater good, we're gonna need the participation of everyone. And if we don't kind of um, get that game squared away, I think we will be at a peril where China will come in and haven't already um, kind of beat us at that. Here at the Atlanta University Center, we are really working hard to develop diverse talent to go into artificial intelligence, to go into machine learning. For example, Spelman College, which is in our consortium, is a historically black women's college and they have an artificial intelligence machine learning initiative that is funded by the DOD Army Research Lab. And through this grant, Spelman has trained 42 pre-freshman students. So these are students coming into college in AI and ML technologies. So, and students have also went on to do additional research and machine learning with the Army Research Lab personnel along with Spelman faculty. So having both of our students and our faculty engage in this funded research opportunity with those at the Army Research Lab helps us build our AI ML expertise and programs. And this early exposure encourages our students, which are majority black, go off and diversify this field of AI, ML and increase representation. So I note that Spelman is our country's leading producer of black women who complete PhDs in STEM. I myself am a proud product of Spelman and I've been faculty administrator at other HBCUs. And I believe that continuing investments in HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions must continue. And if we are really going to develop this diverse talent pool, 
So we really need to become smarter with this much needed investment if we are really serious about diversifying the AI research talent pool to ensure that our nation remains strong in both AI and ML. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a question for all the panelists and I'm gonna get to some more of the Q&A from the audience. Um, so I'd like each of you just kind of it, as quickly as you can sum up. Um, so when I worked in DC, many have pointed out this valley of death between bringing forth fundamental research, applied research and deployments to benefit society. And in, in AI, things move very quickly. How do each of you foresee bridging this gap between research and enterprise or production of good things to society? And how does it entail maybe bridging public and private research? So um, perhaps you wanna start from the top, uh, Dr. Corley, would you like to start with that? And then we'll go to the other panelists. Sure, maybe I'll frame it in the context of, you know, what we're doing in the, the DOE where, you know, often we have basic and applied research um, and thinking about what are the next frontiers, um, you know, to, to, to do that. Um, you know, for us, I think the most important uh, aspects of, of technical development that are driving innovation that really can help get over that, that technology technological gap between basic research and getting it into the hands of, of, of you um, really falls into three categories and it's really scalable, assured, and then fielding that AI. And that's what we're talking about here is, is fielding. But the first part on scalable AI, you know, we're really focused on developing the science, technology, and engineering to tackle grand challenges that use multiple types of information um, you know, this requires developing new approaches to building and deploying models. And, and really today, AI algorithms are, are started are built on one type of, of data. But in the future, it needs to work like we do as humans um, and learn from multiple senses or multiple forms of data. And so that's one way I think, you know, having AI models and development be much more realistic and usable. Um, in the real world. The, the second piece to get over that valley of death is this the assurance piece, or at least how I, I frame it as assurance. And really, you know, we're driving assured AI systems that are explainable. Um, we, we heard about that from Dr. Jenkins, operate safely um, and as we expect them to. You know, there's been some popular press about how vulnerable AI systems are. Uh, most of us have probably seen them, whether it's intentional or unintentional, um, where they give wrong answers. There's a great example from Black Hat, uh, which uh, um, you're probably familiar with from Tencent Keen Labs in 2018, where they showed that a Tesla autopilot could be fooled um, to make actions that were unexpected. And it really exposed vulnerabilities in a, in a working you know, machine learning system. So this is really just a practical example of why we need more trustworthy and robust AI, um, really in high consequence systems to enable that trust at least for the DOE um, and other US government missions, that's the, the second piece that can help us bridge that gap between uh, the Valley of Death as, as, you, as, you, as you framed it. And lastly, it's bringing those two together and, and fielding AI. Um, the National Security Commission on AI uh, report that came out also talked about a lot about fielding AI um, in our world. And it's really necessary to ensure that our applications are useful um, and impactful, and they translate into real world impacts. And I think there was a question in, in the, the Q&A about how do, uh, how, does, you know, how do we as citizens of the US take advantage of, of AI? And really one of our jobs as AI developers is making sure that we can also translate those uh, basic research advances. So really getting the academic, corporate and government laboratories, uh, AI advances out of the lab um, and bringing them to bear on modern applications, you know, ranging from the edge and the internet of things, accelerating drug discovery and materials discovery, protecting the grid. You know, I think all these things are ways that, you know, fielding AI really is going to enable us to bridge that gap, um, you know, between the two, so. Any of the other panelists want to address that? I know, uh, Blaze, you talked a little about that with Google. Anything to add to Dr. Corley about what Google might be doing? Um, yeah, I, there, uh, so um, yes to all of Dr. Corley's points. I'd, I'd add a couple more as well. Um, I mean, in many ways, you know, what, what, um, what my team and, and others at Google do, it, you know, is, is very much, uh, you know, crossing valley of death type problems, uh, taking, taking uh, theoretical advances and turning them into, uh, into applied uh, ML, applied, applied research and, and, and product. Uh, in many cases, that builds on decades uh, of, of, of earlier government funded work. And I would also say that, you know, 
it, once, once we already know what discipline something is, uh, in many ways, uh, the, the hard work is done. Um, you know, I, what I think is not often appreciated is that a lot of the fundamental advances in AI actually came from neuroscience, um, came from, uh, from biology, from other fields, uh, and, and from interdisciplinary work. Uh, and you know, we do a certain amount of collaboration with, uh, with academics in those fields, but um, you know, the, the, the sort of, of exploratory and basic research that has to be done in order to seed that, that space is much, much larger than the sort of tip of the iceberg that we see in this, in this kind of valley of death crossing stage. Uh, the kind of government resources that are focused on tech transfer and solutions, uh, like the ones called for in USICA and the, the NSF for the Future Act, uh, I think are really important to all of this. Um, I, I also think that that um, you know I, a couple of the other panelists have brought up questions of of uh, Internet of Things and security and hacking. Um, I, I also see a real need for um, for baselines of uh, especially security of Internet of Things uh, and of operating systems that run ML. Uh, this is this is still very much the Wild West, and you know as as a as an, uh, an AI researcher, I would very much like to see the sort of computational foundations where we're running all of these things secured a lot better than they are right now. And that would be a place where regulation would really help. Thank you. That is music to my ears, at least from security. Um, I want to ask uh, Dr. Jenkins to jump in next and then Dr. Smith. So uh, would you like to t t jump in, please, Dr. Jenkins? Right. I, and so I, I can't emphasize enough uh, the, the, the need for seed corn. I think that's the word that, that was used and that, um, and that the AI that you're seeing today is really the result of people having the vision many decades ago. Um, you know, AI, AI the, 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 um, the neural networks that we, that we have was very much outside the mainstream. And it took people who were who had some support uh, you know, not a lot of support, but but they took what they had in order to to show the promise of the technology. Um, basic research can be considered abstract or useless, um, but um, but it take but but and 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 you know and but that's what it might look like when it's in its messy, formidable stages uh, for you know for in when it's being formed. Um, but if you give it time and you give it some. Uh, some uh, uh, give it the chance to develop. That's when we start to see the breakthroughs. I don't think people saw this this um, the second wave of AI, the neural networks that were that, that are now mainstream. Nobody, very few people predicted that. Um, but we were fortunate that there were that we had diversity in our intellectual landscape that allowed it to happen. And that requires uh, you know not overfitting to one particular mindset. And thinking there's going to be a, a laser focused way that we're going to we're going to be able to explore this space. Um, this requires letting a thousand flowers bloom and then seeing what comes up. I'm going to uh, defer to Dr. Washington next because she actually worked for the, the person who wrote the Valley of Death uh, thing that we all kind of go by. So Dr. Washington, please uh, jump in first. Yeah, so Dev Amon, he was one of the co-authors of that paper, Crossing the Valley of Death, Transitioning Cybersecurity Research and the Practice. And he was my supervisor at the National Science Foundation when I worked in the uh, convergence research, the convergence accelerator. So the convergence accelerator essentially brings together, converges different disciplinary fields to tackle national scale societal challenges that really frankly can't be solved with a single discipline. And the idea to accelerate is because we need answers now. And so they're on accelerated track with a curriculum that supports the researchers as they go along so that they can develop these cutting edge solutions to really bring these long lasting um, societal nuggets. And we funded things from open knowledge networks using AI and future jobs, figuring that out. Also looking at the national talent ecosystem, quantum, advancing quantum technology, and also AI driven innovation via data and model sharing. And all of these programs really require these diverse topics to come to diverse researchers and people from diverse sectors to come together through this convergent approach so that they can produce deliverables, right? And so this isn't necessarily the, you know, the not speaking for NSF, but this isn't the regular NSF program where we're where we they would expect people to publish papers, but they actually expect people to create deliverables that specifically make society better here in this country. So it's a bit of a different shift. And as we know that NSF now, you know, my first name is Talitha, starts with a T, so I like T. So they wanna put the T into the NSF technology, taking the research, you know, from the bench side into the public domain that people can actually use it. 
And, but that's a shift in, in our scientific community. And it will be really interesting to see how this shifting of our focus and how we do things in science and how we value what we do in science really will come along with that venture. So having worked in the Converge, Convergence Accelerator, I've seen firsthand about how these different teams can come together and address how to do um, push innovations in quantum, how to use um, these AI federated learning with across different health systems data, you know, to really push us forward in a way that I don't think we have seen yet before. So I'm really excited about the work of the Convergence Accelerator at NSF. That was a, a highly transformative program. Thank, thank you for your work on that. So uh, let's wrap up, uh, Dr. Smith, if you had some comments and then uh, we have some uh, Congress people to give some of their closing remarks. So Dr. Smith. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with my fellow panelists here. Investment from government is absolutely essential. Um, and if we see that uh, we let industry um, take care of the, the majority of investments around research, they will focus more on legacy needs. Um, yet, if we don't invest enough on the basic research side from the US government, we get air gaps in the system and we don't really have the, the flow forward. I think some of the programs like the Convergence Accelerator and NSF are um, really a recipe for what's needed here. We need to partner together across government and industry throughout the whole life cycle. So from basic research to translational research to commercialization. And if we can do this, invest together, uh, partner together, and commit to outcomes together, then I think we have a good chance at overcoming you know, some of what's required here to, to move forward. Thank you, that was a, an amazing panel. I wish we had more time. Um, our panelists are gonna stay on. We're gonna, we're gonna have some Congress people videos now, some comments. Please continue to put your questions in the Q&A box and our panelists, they're starting to type them in. Uh, but thank you very much. We could, I'm sure, go on for several hours with everybody's uh, fascinating comments. So we now have some closing comments from uh, two congressmen. Uh, I'll introduce them, then we'll hear their uh, videos. The first is Representative Obernolte from California. U.S. Congressman Jay Obernolte proudly represents California's 8th District in the House of Representatives, a video game developer and business owner. He serves on the Committee on Natural Resources, Budget, and Science, Space, and Technology, and in a leadership role as a freshman class representative to the House Republican Policy Committee. He holds a BS in Engineering and Applied Science from Caltech, an MS in Artificial Intelligence from UCLA, and a doctorate in Public Administration from California Baptist University. Uh, after that, we'll hear from Representative Bill Foster from Illinois. Congressman Foster is a scientist and a businessman representing the 11th Congressional District of Illinois, a position he's held since 2013. He is the only PhD physicist in Congress and he serves on the House Financial Services Committee and on the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Let's hear our closing remarks, please. Hello, I'm Congressman Jay Obernolte. It is an honor for me to address the forum today. Artificial intelligence and next generation computing are subjects that are very near and dear to my heart. I may be unique in all of Congress in that I have a master's degree in artificial intelligence. I also am an entrepreneur. I own a video game development studio that I founded out of my dorm room at Caltech 30 years ago. And uh, I still have 28 employees in the technology industry today. So in my career, I've written many millions of lines of code. And that gives me a passion to make sure that our research and development infrastructure in the United States is adequate to provide for our future needs in computer science, but artificial intelligence in particular. And I think this is more important now than ever because we all know the beneficial ways that artificial intelligence can enhance life for Americans over the next hundred years. But also recent events have illustrated the need for more computer science professionals to protect our national infrastructure from foreign actors who might want to disrupt it using the principles of computer science and using artificial intelligence. I mean, you've seen uh, the attack on the, uh, the pipeline uh, that uh, took down oil delivery for most of the East Coast. Uh, I think most, uh, a lot of us were very alarmed when there were gas stations up, up and down the East Coast, including here in Washington, D.C., that uh, didn't have any gasoline as a result of the pipe 
the uh, attack on the colonial pipeline. Uh, and then also JBS meat processing, one of the largest meat processors in the country, shut down by another ransomware attack. Uh, those are things that illustrate the need for vigilance in the field of computer science. And I think that we in government have an obligation to make sure that we have the tools to meet that challenge. So I'm working on a number of different pieces of legislation uh, in that space. Uh, first of all, uh, just uh, yesterday, I had a bill passed committee that would establish a new occupational series for federal employment for computer science professionals, such as people working in artificial intelligence and working in data science. Uh, it amazes a lot of people, and it certainly amazed me when I found out about it, that we don't have occupational classifications for those disciplines within the federal government. They only exist in pure research settings. And I think we can all agree that we need to attract that kind of technical talent to careers in federal employment if we are to have any chance at competing in this next generation workspace. And then also, I think it's incredibly important for us to support uh, our early career students and graduate students who want to pursue fields in uh, careers in fields like artificial intelligence. And that's why uh, I've introduced legislation a couple of months ago, uh, the uh, traineeships and fellowships for Early Career AI Researchers Act, which would create both fellowships and uh, scholarships for students just entering the field of artificial intelligence. And I'm, I'm very happy that that passed the House of Representatives a couple of weeks ago, it was included in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, NSF for the Future Act, uh, which is uh, something that I was very pr proud to co-sponsor and uh, really hope that that's going to set us on the path for success. Uh, and then uh, also uh, another thing that I am very interested in is next generation computing. And so I authored legislation uh, called the Next Generation Computing uh, Research and Development Act to try and stimulate more U.S. investment in post-exascale computing. And uh, most of you might be familiar with the lingo, but I'll just, it's, it's very important to understand why this is such a game changer. So I'll just take a minute to, to go into why uh, the legislation is important. Uh, when I learned how to program 35 years ago, we measured computer speeds in millions of instructions per second. And that was that we thought that was really fast. But what we really care about now as scientists is we care about floating point operations, which are much more complicated. And we measure the speed of a computer, not in its ability to execute instructions, but instead in its ability to crunch numbers, because those are what we're really interested in doing when we talk about complex scientific modeling and solving problems. So we measure it in floating point operations per second. Uh, and uh, just recently, the world has seen the introduction of the first exaflop computers. That's uh, 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. So it's almost a mind-bogglingly large amount of computing power. But the reason why an, exa, uh, an exaflop is important and the, why, the reason why exascale computers are important is because the first time computers are approaching the computing horsepower of the human brain, which biologists estimate is about uh, an exaflop. So we are going to be able to do things in artificial intelligence that we have never been able to do before because up until now, AI has relied on heuristic algorithms that take shortcuts to try and get a computer to do what the human brain can do. But we're not going to have to do that anymore with exascale computing. So uh, my bill, the Next Generation uh, Computer uh, Research and Development Act, will will stimulate post -exas investments in post exascale computing and make sure that capability exists here in the United States. And it also creates grant programs for energy efficient computing because uh, as most professionals in the field will tell you, uh, the, the production of heat is one of the barriers for making computers faster. And if you look at uh, the, the exaflop exa computer at Lawrence Livermore National Labs that will be operational in the next couple of years, uh, that's going to consume 40 megawatts of power, just that one computer. So you can imagine the need to, uh, to reduce the amount of energy that, that goes into that. So uh, uh, very happy that that passed. Uh, also, the House of Representatives a couple of weeks ago as part of the DOE for the Future Act, and uh, really uh, hopeful that that uh, passes the Senate also and, and creates those programs. Uh, so I, I want to thank you very much for your support of uh, efforts in the United States to stimulate investment, not just in computer science, but also yeah, specifically in artificial intelligence. I'm a big believer that what we are doing in this space is going to change the world for the better. 
uh, for not just the people that we represent, but people all over the world. So uh, thank you for your interest and uh, thank you for your support as we embark on this journey together. Hello, I'm Congressman Bill Foster. As the only PhD physicist in the US Congress and uh, perhaps the only particle accelerator builder, chip designer, and AI programmer in Congress, I am honored to represent the 11th Congressional District of Illinois. And I want to thank the Task Force on American Innovation for inviting me to participate in this important discussion on a topic that I've been focusing on in Congress, the future of artificial intelligence and machine learning. As you know, I'm the chairman of the Financial Services Committee's Task Force on Artificial Intelligence. And over the past few years, I've led hearings aimed at advancing our understanding of AI and its impact on our economy so that members of Congress are better equipped to tackle the issues that arise from it. Some of our early areas of focus have been on the potential effects of AI on social equity, where a poorly chosen objective functions such as simple profit maximization can cause it to amplify existing historical biases present in training data sets, or the voracious appetite of AI for both training data and compute power, which can aggravate the natural tendencies of all digital businesses to evolve towards oligopolies or monopolies, not because of intrinsic evil of the participants, but simply due to the increasing returns to scale of any digital business. Just last week, we held a hearing focused on how we can best leverage AI to preserve personal privacy through secure digital identification, a long overdue and necessary tool for the United States economy to transition into the digital age while preventing fraud, ensuring privacy, and improving equity. And a secure digital ID will be increasingly dependent on the ability of a modern cell phone to recognize its owner uh, to know when it's been lost or stolen, and this will be increasingly dependent on the incredible AI capabilities of next generation cell phone chipsets. It will depend on a modern cell phone's ability to use its secure enclave and secure compute facilities to make digital ID impossible to clone or counterfeit, a capacity that will put a premium on trusted silicon foundries, which will put under stress the global trade models which have not distinguished the fundamental difference between free democracies of the world and those with trusted court systems and those regimes which use technology to control and oppress. The fact is developments in AI at the, are at the forefront of innovations that are transforming the way Americans live, work, and interact with one another. From weather forecasting to autonomous driving vehicles, manufacturing robots, uh, and the list is long. AI technology is here to stay, and it will be used in ways both seen and unseen, anticipated and unanticipated. There are two pressing needs that will determine whether America will be the world leader on AI or to spend the next few decades playing catch up. First, we need to sustain robust government investment in AI and machine learning research that will pave the way for breakthroughs of the future. For decades, our national laboratories have led the way on scientific innovation. They're the crown jewels of our nation's scientific infrastructure, and they're poised to remain central to our R&D, including in the AI field, if we continue to invest in their work. Many national labs came into existence because of the scale of state-of-the-art scientific facilities becoming simply too large for universities and university researchers to have access to the crucial equipment to perform competitive research. Uh, this situation appears to be playing out again in AI. And I'm proud to represent Argonne National Laboratory as part of the 11th District of Illinois and, to, and the work that they are doing with supercomputing AI and providing researchers trusted access to sensitive data sets, which is something that we can all take pride in. Sustained investment in R&D will allow us to tackle the challenges of tomorrow, but our leadership in those issues also depends on a second recipe, preparing our workforce for the jobs of tomorrow. AI's disruptive potential will affect jobs all over for our economy, from blue collar to white collar and everything in between. I, it's really never been more important to, 
people with STEM skills at a very high range. Careers in STEM fields are expanding and the need for students to enter those fields is growing quickly. Over the past decade, STEM jobs have grown three times faster than non-STEM jobs. And yet we still do not have enough students graduating in STEM fields to fill, fill those jobs. So we have a lot of work to do to keep America at the forefront of our rapidly changing global economy. And it will take all of us working together to do so. And that's why the work that you are doing is so important and why I'm proud to call you a partner in this. Thank you again for inviting me. Those are some great remarks from our Congress people. Thank you to the Task Force on American Innovation for hosting this. Thank you to our panelists. They're all found online. If you have follow-up questions, I see more in the Q&A. They have fascinating answers. Thank you to our members of Congress and staffers for listening and contributing to this important discussion. Um, Stuart, is there anything else um, before we wrap up? I think that's a wrap. Thank you everybody for your time and uh, have a great rest of your day.